Last week, uh, Rick gave a sermon on the emotions that we should start to kind of feel from Christmas. Christmas is a wonderful time of the year. And one of the things he said was that we should want to worship and have great thanksgiving. And as I was listening to his sermon, it struck me that a lot of Christians consider worship to be kind of a small little thing. Come to church, sing some songs, hear a message, feel better, go home. And I was wondering, you know, I kind of, in a way, look at it that way a little bit myself. So I started looking into worship. And of course, like I always do, I looked up the word in the dictionary. And, you know, worship, um, where am I? Yes, that's where I am. Um, there, there's a, a kind of a long definition for, for um, worship, but part of it is do homage. That's part of the definition. And homage means, like in feudal times, service due to a vassal to, to his overlord, a tribute, respect paid, reverence, deference. And something struck me about that definition. It was the word deference. Uh, deference, okay, what do you mean deference? Defer, what do I defer? How can that be part of worship? And so I thought about it and I thought about it and I prayed about it. And then I said, well, okay, let's look up the definition of deference. Um, the definition of defer, to submit, to yield, or bow to the opinion of others. And the definition of opinion is judgment or belief, estimation of or formal statement by an expert. Defer. What do I defer to Jesus? Now, in my store, for the last four years, I've had a particular store manager who just got transferred. So we lost our great store manager. He was wonderful. However, our new store manager is proving to be just as wonderful. But anyways, four years ago, when he came to our store, Lowe's was a task store. Everybody came to work. They did their tasks. They ignored the customers, pretty much. And the store was beautiful. Everything was down stock. But we weren't making that many sales because the customers didn't feel like we cared if they were there. So he came in and the first thing he did was try to change our culture from task to customer service. And when he first came in and started doing that, it was like pulling teeth. Nobody wanted to do that because part of becoming customer oriented is become um, employee oriented, helping your employees, doing everything you can to help each other out, not just letting people slide and have all kinds of problems. And so what happened was, as time went on, a few of us started to catch his vision and we decided that we were going to defer what we believed to what he believed. And it was interesting what happened. It wasn't six months until the majority of the store was believing in what he said. And so that store has gone from a $25 million store, God willing, will be a $35 million store at the end of this quarter. We're really, really close. And what that means is lots more employees to help our customers. And that's why we're doing it. So that is defer. We deferred what we believed to what he believed. But something else really interesting happened is that our old beliefs started to disappear and we really started to believe what he said. It became a part of us, and it started to spread out into the community when we got home. It's interesting what happened. Rick and I, we have a deferred relationship right now. I have deferred a lot of my responsibilities to Rick. And you know why? Because the old Rick had made some enemies at headquarters. The new Rick is a totally different person. I mean, he's just as hardworking, just as gung-ho as he always was, but the reasons are different. And by him running this church, whenever they say, hey, you're doing a pretty good job, I said, I'm not, Rick's doing it. He's doing 99% of it to change those minds. Because unless they see it, they're not going to change. So I have deferred a great deal to Rick. He calls me up and says, this is what I'm doing. I'm like, cool. I might ask a question once in a while, but he never does anything that a pastor wouldn't do or would do. He's doing great. 
And I hope and pray, and I hope you're all hoping and praying that God will change those minds so we can get Rick ordained. I want him ordained. Anyways, how about Christmas itself? Have you ever noticed that about Thanksgiving until a couple days after Christmas, people on the roads seem to be nicer than they were? <laughs> I've noticed it. People slow down and let you in. Sometimes it gets so bad you don't want to get in, but they stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it does. And I've noticed that in the driving. Um, with our customers, there's a nicerness with them. They're nicer to people. There's a deference from our old selfish selves to a, hey, you know, this is the time of God's being born. This is a lot of good things are happening. You know, I'm going to be nicer to people for a while. They're nicer to their kids. They're nicer to their wife. They're nicer to their husband. And it's kind of a Christmas thing that I've noticed happens every year. And that's, we're deferring our, what we really are to what we really should be. And thankfully, it rubs off a little bit on everybody every year, to a degree. It, it, it's one of those progressive things. Now, we know that God is a family. And we, and we, as part of that family, need to defer our will to God's will. You know, God commands us to worship him. <clears throat> Matthew 4.10 You must worship the Lord thy God. Serve him only. And that word there, if you look up that particular word for worship, one of the first meanings is to, to give to God. To give your will to God is what it means. I, I put a scribble in here, but I just can't read it. Oh, give your consent to God. That's what that says. You know, you know you guys, I'll show you something. See my notes? Aren't they nicely typed? Well, then as you go, God tells you other stuff, and you start scribbling because you don't have time to fix it. <laughs> and then you end up with something you can almost read. So the worship here means give your consent to God and give your consent only to God. You know, and God also tells us how he wants to be worshipped. You know, in the story of the Samaritan woman there by the well, and Jesus is talking to them and, and teaching her some things, and she, she says, um, he says to her, in John 4:23 uh, and 24, God is looking for people who will worship him in spirit and truth. So we're not only told we're to worship him, he tells us exactly how to worship him. So I'm sitting there thinking about that word spirit. All right, what does that mean? You know, does it, there's a lot of things it could be. That word can mean a current of air, just the wind blowing around. So if that's what it meant, we, have to, we should be sitting in front of the wind or a fan when we worship. Probably not the meaning that this one is given. Um, the other one is, in, in human terms, the rational soul. Spirit could mean the rational soul. It could mean mental disposition. Or it could mean a spirit being. God, Jesus, Holy Spirit. Angels, Satan, demons. It could mean all of that. So when I'm looking at this word, I put those in there. Which ones actually fit in spirit? What is the spirit that I'm supposed to be praying and worshiping in? I think that it's my heart, mind, and soul needs to be. That's the spirit God's talking about. When I, when I worship God, it needs to be with all that I am. I'm doing it because I want to. I'm doing it because I need to. I'm doing it because I want to please my Father in heaven. And I want to become like his son Jesus. So there's an honesty in there. Because that's the next word, truth. Honesty and truth. And you look up that word, it says, as it really is. This can be the tough one for us. Because a lot of times we don't know how it really is. Or we're not willing to tell God how it really is. God wants us to be deadly truthful. He doesn't want us to come up and say, yeah, everything's fine, God, when really it's not. He wants to, Dad, this is horrible. I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. This is the most rotten thing that's ever happened to me. This is what I did. This is what I didn't do. I didn't defer this to you. I didn't do that. I did do this. And he wants us to be deadly honest with him. 
He wants us to tell him how it really is. And how it really is is how we see it. And once we admit that to him, he can take steps to help us fix it. I've already said, I'm just finding out where I'm at. <laughs> yes, federal way. Okay, so, so in the life of a Christian, God does want us something from us. And really, it's one thing. John 6, 29. He wants us to believe in the one he sent. Now, the word believe, if you look it up in the concordances, it's to trust or have faith. That's the word that was translated into believe. That's the one thing he wants from all of his children, is to trust and have faith in Jesus. And this Christmas is such a wonderful time for us to remember what Jesus did for us and all the promises that he's made. And we can trust that he's going to give it to us. Do we? Do we truly believe in Jesus? I mean, that song was perfect. I mean, in fact, all those songs were perfect for this sermon. So as we go about our lives, do we realize that the one thing God wants from us more than anything else is that we truly, truly, with all our heart, minds, and soul, believe in the one he sent, which is Jesus Christ. And all the stuff that Jesus has said to us in the Bible, do we really believe that? Are we willing to worship God day in, day out, second by second, month by month, and defer everything that we believe is right and take on what Jesus says is right? Do we? That's a hard thing. It takes a lot of work and time for us to do that. It takes our thinking about it, paying attention to our thoughts, our reactions, what we do, how we say things. After we've done something, do we think about it? Do we go, wow, that's what happened. How come I did that? Oh, that's not a really good reason. That's not love. That was something else. I did not defer to Jesus. Because Jesus came to this planet and he died for us. He came as a little baby, fully human, fully God, unwilling to use his powers as God without the Father telling him it's okay. He would not do anything that the Father did not tell him to do. He was here, and that's his example. And we're told that we need to defer our heart, our mind, and our soul to him. And then what happens if you can do that? The more you defer, the more your habits change. We are creatures of habit. And as you defer to Jesus' ways of love, gentleness, kindness, all the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it becomes you. And the more it becomes you, the more powerful of an instrument you become for God to use to call others. But it all comes down to worship is this heartfelt, I love you so much, I will do anything you say. You know how it is that sometimes some people will worship a particular angel, like people used to worship Elvis Presley? Really, some did. They loved him so much, they would go to every show. They would try to talk like him, walk like him, sing like him, dress like him. They still do. And they still do to this day. And there's all kinds of people around the world that people like to worship, so to speak. I want to be just like him. And I'll do whatever I have to, to be that way. Yeah, and see, as Christians, do we have those feelings towards God? Worship is a crux of us being a child of God. You know, in worship is also our prayer, our Bible study, our fastings, and our good deeds, and all that. That's all worship. That's all deferring to God. And it's something that we as Christians really, 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 really need to think about. I've got about 15 minutes and I want to talk about something same line, but just a little bit different. I want to ask some questions. First one is about God the Father. How do you feel?
towards God the Father? What is your gut feeling towards him? Are you warm and fuzzy towards the Father? Or is there something else in there? Think about that. You don't have to answer anything. Just consider that. We need to think about these questions. We need to know in our heart of hearts how we feel about God the Father. Sometimes I'm warm and fuzzy. Sometimes I'm scared to death. Sometimes I'm concerned, but I'm never afraid, as in he's going to kill me type of afraid. I fear God. I know what he can do. I know my life is in his hands. I know that my father is the boss. I know that the buck stops there. And I know that everything I do that isn't deferred is bad, and it hurts him. He doesn't like to see it. I know if I repent, he forgives me instantly. My relationship with my Father in heaven is kind of based on my relationship with my father. I've had a pretty good relationship with my dad, but he was a screamer. So, but you know, I don't see God as a screamer. I see God as, hey son, uh, this is what you need to do. Let's get it done. And here's how I'm going to help you do it. So do you have a vision of God? It's like the song says, when Jesus come, will you throw your arms around him? Will you faint? If you haven't thought about it, chances are you'll just stand there. Because a human being, if they haven't planned on what they're going to do in a situation that surprises them, they just stand there with a blank look on their face. They don't know what to do. So we need to consider how we feel towards the Father. How do you react to the Father? You know, there are times we know that God has spoken to us. Are you uh, react to his uh, instruction with happiness, anticipation, or with fear and intrepidation? How do you react to God? And is that reaction what it should be? And each one of us has to determine for ourselves how we do these things. You know, it's not the same for all of us. It's going to be different for all of us. We're all different individuals, different people, different backgrounds, different needs, different strengths, different weaknesses. And it's going to be different. But we need to think about it. We need to go, okay, if I'm afraid of God, how come I'm afraid of God? If I fear to spend time with him, why do I fear to spend time with him? What is it? What can be done? And how do you see him? Like a loving father? Or a big mean ogre that's got a lightning bolt and he's going to whack you as soon as you do something wrong? Or something in between? And why? Why do you feel that way? What is it about your life that has made you feel that way? If we can figure those out, if we can get a grip on those, we can go to God and say, Hey, Dad, I've got this feeling towards you and I don't want it. I want to defer you as the loving, kind, gentle God, my Father who I will spend eternity with, who loves me and only wants the best for me. What about Jesus? How do we feel about him? Do we love him and appreciate him? Or are we in awe of what he does for us? Do you sit there and consider, Man, I don't know that I could do that, what he did. Go on the cross like that and suffer like that. But he had a great reason for it, and you're all sitting right here. He did it because he loves you all. And he wants to be nothing but your big brother, your savior, your friend, help you do the stuff you need to do, and spend eternity with you. How do we react to Jesus? Do we defer to him? Do we spend all of our time praying, studying, walking with him? I'm not saying on your knees. I mean, if you're walking down the street, are you talking to Jesus as you go? Are you at work and, you, and you're doing something? Say, hey, Jesus, is this going to work? Is that going to work? What do I do? This is a bad situation I'm getting into. How am I going to get this taken care of? Help me. If you stay in constant contact with Jesus, then you're deferring yourself to him. And, you know, so how do you see Jesus? A living big brother? A protector? 
role model, best friend. I don't know. It's, each of us see him differently. I see him as a buddy. And when you and, and that gets me into a little bit of a situation sometimes where I, I might say some things that really, no, nah, I shouldn't say stuff like that to you. You are also my God. So I got to keep it within the realm of decency, so to speak. <laughs> How about the Holy Spirit? How do you feel about him? Thankful? Odd? Safeguarded? I mean, he's, he's the power that God uses to do everything. He teaches us. He knows what God used to create the world. He's there everywhere. He comes into you, makes you eternal. You get to live forever now because you have the Holy Spirit in you. Teaches us. Gives us ideas. He, I mean, you know, when you're studying, some of the weirdest ideas come to you, and all of a sudden you go, oh, wow. That is what that means. That's the Holy Spirit teaching. Or you you're, can't understand something, then somebody says some comment, and it strikes a, a belief, and then, wow, that's what that means. And he does it over and over and over again. It can come to you in meditation. It can come to you just before you fall asleep. It can come to you while you're running down the street being chased by a dog. The Holy Spirit will teach whenever he wants to. And I'm just in awe of that. It's like the four songs. The machine breaks down. Rick just randomly picks four songs. And every single one of them fit this sermon perfectly. So how do we react to the Holy Spirit? With expectation? With awe? Inspired? Waiting for the next thing he's going to teach you? Next thing he's going to do for you? How do we see him? Do we feel empowered, taught, guided? These are questions that we need to ask about our God. We need to know in our hearts and soul what we truly believe. Because if we do, then when we're worshiping and we're talking to God and we're praying, we can be in the spirit and we can be in the truth. And sometimes the truth is, I don't know how I feel. Father, I just don't know. But I want to know. Be gentle as you teach me how I'm the, I'm the I feel. Because worship, <laughs> this time of year, it really explodes in most of us. We want to be closer to God. We want to go to church. Some of the churches put on these beautiful pageants about Christ's birth or maybe about the three wise men or about... Um, the shepherds and all the things that happened to show that this baby was the Lord God most high in the flesh. The king of everyone. The king of kings. The ruler of the entire universe. The one who holds every one of our lives in his hand. He's the one that went to that cross and died for us. So we are sinless in his eyes. And now we can have a relationship with the Father. So as we go about our lives and as we worship, remember, worship starts from the moment you believe in Jesus and it never stops, ever. We will be in this mode of worship for eternity. Why? Because God is worth it. He is worthy of worship. He is worthy of our hearts, our minds, and our souls. He is worthy of our honesty. He is worthy of whatever we are able to give. You know, I think about Jesus' birth, life, death. You know, we always like to think about, yeah, we get to live forever and all of that. But you know, the greatest thing that Jesus did in all of that, he made it so that I can fellowship with God the Father personally, one-on-one. -on -one. He gave us that gift. And that is the greatest gift that any human being could ever have. You can go to God the Father anytime you want and talk right to him. And you can babble and say all kinds of stupid stuff. And our Lord Jesus is right there saying, well, this is what he means. This is what this means. This is what he's thinking about. This is what I was feeling. Because I lived it. 
I know exactly what he's feeling. Now, does he have to do that with the Father? I don't know if he has to, but Scripture says he does. And we love him for it. So remember, when you're worshiping, which is all the time, be honest. Do it with your whole heart and soul. And if you can't do it with your whole heart and soul, be honest with God. You know, Dad, I'm kind of upset here. I don't know if my whole heart is in this. I'm trying to defer to you, but it's hard. Your ways are the right ways. And I will always do the things the way you want it done. And you know, part of the reason that we can do that is because he gave us this book. This book has God in it. And if we study it and study it and study it, if we pray about it, if we meditate about it, if we ask God for understanding, if we use our helps, which we're so blessed to be in a society we are, because you have concordances and all kinds of things that you can look up what these words meant in the original language, because there's lots of meanings, and sometimes the one that the translators pick is part of it, but not all of it. Sometimes the words have changed so much that they don't even mean what they used to. So we have to, as we go that, the Holy Spirit teaches us things. And as you learn this thing, then this thing makes sense, and this thing comes in together. Oops, that was wrong, that all collapses. Let's go back to this, and that comes, and you're, you're just constantly changing. But there's one thing that never changed, that the God the Father sent. I am to become a baby, to grow up, live a perfect life, feel everything every human being ever feels, preach the gospel of himself to everybody, get the church going, and then he allowed people to kill him. He allowed it. He could have stopped it. He said one time that he could bring down legions of angels, but he didn't want to. He always did what the Father asked him to do. Did he ask him to have it do differently? He did, three times. But when the father said, no, nope, I want it this way, he said, let's get her done. And he did. And now he sits at the right hand of God, all the power of the universe at his disposal. And there's no reason that any of us cannot worship him in spirit and truth always. So remember, if you're out with somebody and they're talking about worship, and if they tell you, well, worship is when I go to church, just mention to them, you know, there's a lot more to worship than just singing a few songs and listening to a message. And worship is not a bad thing. You're not groveling in front of God. You're standing there with your shoulders back, proud and happy and elated to be the son of the most, or daughter of the Most High God. Because that's who you people are, every one of you. You are children of the Most High God, just like Jesus Christ is, and you will inherit everything that Jesus is inheriting from the Father. We don't want to become massively proud and that kind of thing with it. Be humble, but understand who you are. And that we can defer to the Father. We should want to defer to the Father. And like Rick said in his sermon, these emotions should well up because of what God did. So as you go about your life, defer and worship the Most High God with your shoulders back and your head high because you are his children. You are part of the family of the Most High God. And that is an amazing, amazing truth of Christmas.